Welcome to Seeking God's Way Bible Study Series, which leads to a new life. Before you, you have your booklet, and we're going to be using this booklet for our Seeking God's Way Bible Study Series. All right, we're back. And before we get started on what we're going to study today, we're going to review just slightly our page 8. So if you want to turn back there to our page 8, just for a moment, just put that there we go. And let's just review very slightly where we've been and where we're going. Okay. So we started out in our study in this area on page 8 with sin. And we spent some time talking about sin, of course. And we determined uh, by our study what sin was and how it happens and what occurs and that it separates us from God. So our solution to sin, which is, of course, our next section here, uh, we began with Jesus and we looked at the Great Commission, as it is called, because it was the Great Commission to the Apostles, as to the solution for the sin problem that we studied. And so when we looked at our uh, three passages we have on our page here, the, all of them found at the end of these three books of the Gospel books, we have the one in Matthew 28, 19, and Mark 16, 15, and 16, and Luke 24, 47, all summarized by our little statement or down here at the bottom where they were told to go preach, okay? They were to make disciples, those who believed the message that was preached, that they were to repent or turn away from their sins, uh, that they were to be baptized for the forgiveness of sins, and then, of course, salvation uh, was mentioned in these passages. We also spent a little bit of time talking about John 3, 1 through 8, where Jesus has a sort of talk with Nicodemus, one of the Pharisees, if you remember, um, and he said that to enter the kingdom of heaven, you had to be born anew by water and spirit. And so we made the summation then as to what Jesus taught about the plan of salvation. Now, the reason why I wanted to go over that just briefly is we're going to be looking in our next chart at what the apostles taught. And so when we turn our page, we find ourselves on the gospel chart. Now, there are several things we want to accomplish here. The first one is to have an absolutely clear biblical understanding of what the word gospel means. So that's why I've got it right at the top of the, of the page. And I put the gospel, recognizing it as a noun, a, a, a specific thing. And we're going to be seeing in the passages we're going to read exactly what the gospel is. It's going to be explained for us. I don't need to interpret it. The Bible is going to do that interpreting for us. Okay. But furthermore, in our study, we want to uh, examine what the apostles taught and see whether it is exactly like what Jesus taught here. Okay, Because we're listening, of course, first we listen to Jesus, now we're going to listen to the apostles, and we're going to see, is this what, what was being taught? Were they teaching what Jesus taught them to teach? Uh, so that's the point of our chart. Now, we also have this wonderful little picture, and we're going to talk about this picture uh, and uh, kind of use it as an illustration a little bit later in our study. But right now, here on our page 9, we're going to start right there at the top, the Gospel, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18. And I believe, Marvin, you're up first in this one. All right. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The message of the cross. And so we're introduced immediately, of course, to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus in this passage. To the world, it's foolishness. They make no sense of it whatsoever. But for we who are uh, saved by it, it means something very personal. And so we're going to be talking about exactly what Jesus talked about, basically. The message of the cross. What is the message of the cross? Now, as we go through our study, we're going to unfold the message of the cross. And at the same time, we're going to define the word gospel. So um, here we are in our chart where it says, are you sure of your salvation? You know, most people who call themselves Christian, they do have in their own mind a reason for calling themselves Christian. Uh, and they may be absolutely uh, honest in every way about what they believe. And that's great. That's wonderful. You need to be honest about what you believe. But we're asking the question, are we sure? Am I sure of my salvation? And when we begin to use the word sure, what comes to mind when we say, are we sure? 
Having no doubt. Having no doubt. So one of the things we're trying to accomplish in our study is to have no doubts. Any thought, Randy? What about sureness? Okay. Am I sure of my salvation? Because I want to be absolutely clear. If I were to die today, am I going to heaven? This is what I want to know. I don't want to worry about it at the moment I die because I may not have time to do that. Okay. I need to find the answers to those questions right now. And that's part of the gospel message. Okay, so let's start in 2 Peter chapter 1, 10 through 12. And uh, this, this one's just entitled on our chart, Confirm Your Call. Randy? 10 through 12. Therefore, brethren, be the more zealous to confirm your call and election. For if you do this, you will never fail or fall. So there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Okay, so notice, does he say something about being sure? What's he say? Confirm your call. Confirm your call. Be sure of what's going on. So Peter's actually asking the question we're talking about here. You know, He said, are you sure? And confirm that you're sure. Now, if we believe ourselves to be Christians, that does not mean we shouldn't confirm what we believe. And we're going to, of course, confirm that by the Scripture itself. We want to be sure, I want to be sure that if either the Lord comes right now or something happens and I die right now, that I don't have to worry about this any longer. This isn't something I'm going to be concerned about because I can say I'm sure. Now, like everything else we've studied, we're going to take our surety from the only source we have that we can be sure of, and that is the Word of God. That's why we're spending our time studying it in that way. All right, so our next passage is in 1 John chapter 2, verse 3, and we're going to go you know, right up to the side there where it says, Can we be sure? Um, and we're going to look at 1 John 2, verse 3, and get, uh, get Marvin to look that one up. And then Randy, if you'll just uh, move over to 513, we're going to read them together here in just a little bit, and then we'll talk more about this being sure. Go ahead, Marvin. Read 1 John 2, 3. Now, by this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. We know that we know him. Some translations say we can be sure that we know him. Mm -hmm. How? If we keep his commands. If we keep his commands. So John, the apostle, says if we keep his commands, we can be sure. Okay, Randy, 5.13. I write this to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Why did John write his letter? So they could know. So they could know. Or be sure. And some translations say to be sure of what? Eternal life. Of eternal life. So part of the very purpose, which goes all the way back to uh, one of our real early lessons in our series, one of the purposes of the Bible is to be sure of our salvation. And of course, as John put it in the first passage in, in chapter 2, verse 3, we are sure when we obey his commands. So a surety comes by obeying and living a life of obedience to his commands. And that John actually spent the time writing down what he wrote down because he wanted us to be able to be sure. So if there's any hope of security in Christ, and if there's any hope of sureness, we're going to find it, of course, within the pages of the Scripture itself. All right. A person must obey to have the Spirit. Acts 5, verse 32. Acts 5.32. All right, Marvin. And we are his witnesses to these things, and so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. To whom does God give the Holy Spirit? <clears throat> those who obey him. Those who obey. Mm -hmm. Now, it, it's pretty plain, right? I mean, it's a pretty clear passage. It doesn't say to those who believe in him. Now, do we need to believe in Him? Yeah. Well, absolutely. When we look at our thing, we've got to believe in Him. But there's a difference between I believe something and I obey something. You say, I can believe something and not obey it. Or I can believe it wrong and then I wouldn't obey it. What, our, what uh, uh, the writer in Acts is offering is the fact that those who receive the Holy Spirit are those who obey Him. And that's very important. 
So not only did John in 1 John say that he wrote this so that we can be sure and we are sure by obeying his command, but here in Acts we cannot have the Spirit without being obedient to him. So the pressure is being put on us. God did his job. Now we must respond with our job. And our job is to learn what we can learn from the Scripture and be obedient to it. Now, in our particular study, we're going to be starting, of course, at the beginning, where we're talking about how does one become a Christian, which is what Jesus was actually talking about. And when we become a Christian, then we have a responsibility to live the life and obey His command. In this, we find security and sureness, confirming our call. Okay. Romans 6, 17 through 18. Obey the form of teaching. Romans 6, 17 and 18. Now, now here in uh, uh, Romans, maybe just prep this just a little bit. Uh, here in Romans, before we read this, uh, there's a long discussion uh, in, in this very, very section, uh, of, and we're going to come back to Romans chapter 6 here in just a minute, whenever we start talking about defining the gospel itself, letting the Word of God define it for us. But one of the things that Paul reminds us in this passage is what the Romans did. Okay, In the Roman church, in the city of Rome, what they did to find salvation. And there's a lot of passages that deal with that. This is just one that we're going to look at very briefly. 17 through 18. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. They were obedient from the what? The heart. The heart. Does that sound like they really believed what they were being taught? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And what did that belief do for them? Or what did they do with that belief? Well, it said it set them free from sin. It sets them free from sin, but they have to do what with it? They have to become, it says here, slaves of righteousness. Okay. And notice he uses the word obey. Yeah. Obey, that form of teaching. So in our study so far, when we talk about are we sure, the way we find security, the way we are sure, is by obedient to his truth. And it all starts with the gospel. It all starts in one place. When we obey the gospel, then at the same time, we begin the process of becoming completely sure of our salvation. This is where we must start. So, we've got to define the gospel itself. Now, right in the middle, we're here in the book of Romans right now, so let's go back to chapter 1, uh, right at the beginning, and see as Paul unfolds the, the uh, message to the Roman church in Rome, we have him talk a little bit about introducing us to the gospel because it is a, a very important aspect of how we're saved. Okay, so Marvin, read our 116 of Romans. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Okay, so I'm not ashamed of... The gospel. You know, so that's the terminology we're using here. The gospel. Because it is the what? It the is the power. power of salvation. Yeah. The power of God to save. Okay. Now let's narrow this down just a little bit here for us. Because we're defining the word gospel. We're let, or better yet, we're letting God define the word gospel for us. In this passage, it says very, very plainly that the gospel is the power of God to save. And he also goes a little step further. Whether it be Jew or Gentile, makes no difference to God. People from all walks of life and every background on earth can come to Christ via the gospel. And Paul wasn't ashamed of it, which seems to indicate the fact that he wasn't in any way um, worried about preaching it, teaching it, no matter what the consequences. It was too important for him not to preach the message of the gospel. And so now we want to try to define it even further. Okay, what's he actually talking about? And as we unfold this a little bit, we're going to let the Apostle Paul continue to tell us a little bit about the gospel. But in this case, we're going to go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and look at 1 through 4. Now here in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15, 
we have the Apostle Paul talking to, of course, a different church in a different place, but he's going to try to tell them very plainly what the gospel is. Now, I love this passage because it means I don't have to try to interpret the gospel. I don't have to try to tell you what it means. Paul is going to do that for us. And I really like it when the Bible does it this way because it just it leaves me out of the picture altogether. It doesn't mean we have to worry about it because it's going to tell us just plainly what, the, what saved the Corinthians. We already found that the gospel is the power to save. That was Romans 1.16. Here he's going to talk to the Corinthians uh, who are saved. He says they are. And he's going to tell them a little bit about this gospel. All right? So, let's read 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Okay. Now I would remind you, brethren, in what terms I preach to you the gospel, which you received, in which you stand, by which you are saved, if you hold it fast, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. All right, so here we have a wonderful introduction. In fact, if you wanted to sit down and read all of chapter 15, the whole chapter is about one thing, the resurrection of Jesus, because there was a little problem in the first century. You know, we've got the same problem today. Some people just don't believe in it. Okay? And they had the same problem in the first century. And so Paul wrote the whole thing about, basically, about uh, the resurrection. But notice here in the, in the beginning of this, excuse me, 1 through 4, we have him, him saying, you're standing in the gospel. I want to remind you of the gospel. I want you to understand the gospel, basically. Okay, And then he tells them what it is. And he says, of first importance, it is what? That Christ died for our sins. Okay, so here we have our little chart, you see. And on our little chart right here in the front, we have this, uh, where, there's our passage mm -hmm. uh, that, we, that we're going to read in a moment about the gospel and its fulfillment. But notice it says here in 1 Corinthians that first off, Jesus died. So we have a cross there. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay. Got our picture? Okay, what was of second importance? He was buried. Buried. So here we have the burial area. Christ coming off the cross and being buried. And third? He rose again. He rose again. So here we have Christ being risen again in our little picture that we have describing here. So the gospel at its very core, okay, is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. Now, we might say, well, the gospel is the whole thing. It is. But what would be the good of the whole thing without the death and the burial and the resurrection? The rest of it would make no sense. The rest of it has no value whatsoever to mankind without one great enormous event. That's why Paul spent so much time in 1 Corinthians talking about the resurrection, because if a person can't believe in the resurrection of Jesus the Christ, then all the rest of it's worthless. It has no value. If we can't believe in that miracle, then what do we do? We have nowhere to turn because we have no Savior. So oftentimes in commentaries and preachers, they call this the heart of the gospel. And the reason they do that is we each have a heart. And it pumps blood to every portion of our body. What happens when it doesn't function? You die. What if it isn't there? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Can we live without it? Nope. And if you don't have the heart of the gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, then there's no hope for man. There's no hope for us. There's no surety in anything. There, there's nothing. It just doesn't exist. Well, there'd be no point in saying there's no, you're a Christian. There's no point in saying you're a Christian. Yeah. There's no point in anything. Because everything about the gospel of Jesus Christ and everything about the scripture, Old and New Testament, revolves around this magnificent event. And the greatest event of all, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay, so did Paul define it for us? Yes. Absolutely. And I don't think there's any way we could escape his definition. His definition is very, very clear. You know, from now on, no matter where you read in the Scripture, because the word gospel appears a great deal of times, but from now on, every time you read the word gospel, just remind yourself of this passage. Because every time you read it, it's going to mean the same thing. Now, it might be talking about the whole thing, but it brings it right back to why we believe the whole thing. Because without this at its core, there is no hope for mankind. All right? Okay, okay. 
Uh, according to 2 Thessalonians 1, 8 and 9, if we kind of follow our chart along here, it says we must obey the gospel. So we kind of move from one thing to another. And let's, let's kind of prep that just slightly. Jesus came to earth to save us from our sins. In the process of being saved from our sins, he had to go all the way up to the cross, the death and the burial and the resurrection. Did Christ have to do this? Yes, yes, he had to do it, and he had to do it a certain way. Everything about his ministry was leading to that point. He told them over and over, this is what's going to happen. Even though they didn't quite understand it always, they, they, they were told very plainly. That everything was leading to it. Even if you read the Old Testament and you look at the 160-some-odd um, expressions there about Jesus, you're going to find it all leading up to the death and the burial and the resurrection, that this was the plan of God that was going to save. So when Paul says in Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed, what's he not ashamed of? The death, the burial, and the resurrection. That's what he's not ashamed of. He's not ashamed to say, I believe in that resurrection. And yes, it was a miracle. And without it, I cannot be saved. Okay, so he's not ashamed of that. But there's something else he's not ashamed of that goes from that scene that Jesus accomplished into the next scene, which is my part of this, my side of this. We've already seen, to be sure, I've got to obey the gospel. I've got to be obedient to the Lord. Okay, now let's notice 2 Thessalonians 1, 8 and 9. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Now here in Thessalonians, let us appreciate the fact that he's talking in the negative. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I mean, very quickly, right? I mean, that's what he talks about. And, of course, he's talking about vengeance, and he's talking about justice. But in this, notice what he says about the gospel. Can you find that part of it, Martin, and just reread it? He says something specific about the gospel, which, which is our topic. Well, that they must obey it. That they, well, that's well, not what it says. Those who do not obey the gospel. Those who do not obey the gospel are going to reap what is said there. Yeah. So then it would lead toward what you said, Martin, that they needed to obey it if they were going to escape what Paul says here, right? Okay, so they are to obey the gospel. If they obey the gospel, they can escape all these terrible things that he talks about here. And so we're introduced in this passage to my obedience to the gospel. Well, we know what the gospel is. It's the death, burial, resurrection. So now we're told we've got to obey it. Now, I could sit here and tell you what that means, you know, I mean, I've studied the scripture, and I can tell you my opinion on what it means to obey the gospel. But the thing is, I don't like my opinions. I want God's opinion. I don't want to interpret it for you. I want you to read it. And so that's why we have Romans 1, 1 through 11. Now notice on our little chart here, in this little chart, we've come from here where we talked about what is God's power. I'm not ashamed. We talked about what is the gospel. We defined it as the death. There we have it in our little picture. Death, burial, resurrection. Okay. Then we talked about the fact that if they didn't obey it, God was going to have vengeance upon them if they didn't obey the gospel. Okay. Now we're here, and, we, and the passage is on the page in two places, here and then up here right above our picture. Okay. And so what we're going to do with Romans chapter uh, 6 um, is we're going to read it very carefully and we're going to pick out in Romans chapter 6 the particular parts about obeying the gospel of Jesus. Now I'm going to read this and I want you to follow along because I'm going to stop as we go along and I'm going to pick up some of the very important points and I'm going to ask a few questions about it. Okay? So let's start right here in uh, Romans chapter 6 and it's going to be 1 through 11. Alright, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Now, let's pause a moment. We're going to keep our finger right there on verses 1 and 2. First off, he says, are we just going to rely on grace and live however we want to live? And the answer was? Certainly not. Certainly not. We're not that, that's not the way grace works. Okay. Instead, he says, you did what? 
Died to sin. Died to sin. All right, let's get our chart out here. Okay. And we have Jesus dying right here on our cross. Right? Mm -hmm. In our picture? Right there. Okay. And here we have a man and another man, and they're standing here in what looks like water, but they're in this picture here, and it says in our passage, they are to die to sin. What does that sound like? Something we've already studied before. If you die to sin, or you turn away from sin. Repent. Repent. Yeah. Okay. So part of this picture immediately revolves around the idea of repenting, or changing our way. Dying to sin. Putting it away. Putting it aside. Okay? So we start out with the Apostle Paul uh, here in Romans chapter 6, 1 and 2, saying we can't live by grace only, basically, because that isn't going to save us. Instead, we die to sin. Christ died for sin. I die to sin. Are we mimicking what Christ did in doing that? It sounds like it. It sounds like it. Okay. That part of this obeying that we've been talking about to not be uh, judged by God is that we must die like Christ died. Christ died for sin, and I died to my sin, but we know he carried my sin. Okay. So that's the first step that we find uh, in Romans chapter 6. All right. Let's go back to our passage and bring in verse 3. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? All right, keep your finger there. Let's go back to our picture. Here's our little picture, right? You can look at yours, you can look at mine. All right, because I'm going to put my finger on it. Here we have the cross, and we die to sin by repentance. And then what does he say about baptism? Buried. 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 Was he buried? Yes, he was. He was buried. So here we have Christ having been buried, and here we have a picture of us being buried in water. Right? There's the picture. Now, we want to remember what Jesus taught to Nicodemus, that you can only enter the kingdom of heaven by water and spirit. Okay, so here we have our water, and according to the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 6, verse 3, we are buried like he was buried. All right, so again, we're mimicking the exact meaning of the word gospel. All right, let's go to uh, verse 4 of chapter 6. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. All right, back to our little picture. All right, we'll go back and forth. First we had, we had the idea of repentance, killing sin, getting it up, then being buried with him in baptism, water, baptism. And then what does verse 4 say? He came out of the grave, and what do we do? We, we come out with newness. We're... Okay, so what we have is here, uh, if we talk about water baptism and you go under the water, what happens if you stay under the water? You don't come up. You don't come up. Okay, you die. Okay. Yeah. What if Christ had stayed in the grave and not resurrected? We wouldn't have the gospel. Nobody would have ever been saved because he would have been like no one, like everybody else. He would have died and remained in the grave. Okay? So here we have uh, uh, the picture fully of the gospel. So as he is resurrected, we are resurrected. The same emblems as we learned the gospel is, is found in the obedience of the gospel itself. All right. Romans chapter 6. Verse 5. Now, the rest of it, 5 through 11, actually offers a definition or a, de a defining mark of what takes place. Okay? So what we have is we have this thing defining itself, and it tells us a little bit about what has happened when we obey the gospel. So let's read. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. 
For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we pause a moment, if we go through the process of repenting, being baptized, and coming out of the water, which is what baptism means, then notice what he says, for he who has died, right, mm -hmm. in the same way Christ did, has been freed from sin. Freed from sin. So that's what I'm looking for, right? The solution to sin. Okay, verse 8. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay? So what do we have? We have our picture. Mm -hmm. We have repentance, burial and baptism, and coming out resurrected like Jesus to the newness of life, just like he says in the passage. So the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 6 defines for us the gospel again, but this time it defines it not only from the fact that Christ died and was buried and resurrected, but my obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ in repentance, baptism, and coming out the other side. Alright, so that's our Romans chapter 6, uh, 1 through 11. Now, let's kind of put a, a cap on the teaching of the Apostle Paul. Galatians, excuse me, Galatians chapter 3, 26 and 27. How do we put on Christ? Some have asked this question. How do we put on Christ? Uh, you know, in our world today, we hear a lot about, let Christ come into your heart. Mm -hmm. um, I don't find that kind of teaching necessarily in Scripture. Instead, we find what we're going to read in Galatians chapter 3, 26 and 27. Okay. For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. What does it say about being baptized? That what did it do? We put on Christ. Put on Christ. You know, some translations say we clothe ourselves with Christ. Hmm. It's not so much him getting into me as me getting into him. <laughs> and that's what baptism of water does. I get into him because I'm mimicking the greatest event of all time. In fact, I, I would venture to say there's a little bit of arrogance talking about him getting into me versus me being covered by him. Right. Okay? Now let's use, use this as an example for a moment. I, Kevin, am a sinner. I know what I am. Nobody needs to take me on a tour of it. I've done that myself, and the scripture has done that. I know how much of a sinner I am. It only took one sin, and I was separated from God. Now, this passage illustrates, though, that when I repent and am baptized and come out of the waters of baptism, I clothe myself, I put on Christ. Now, let's put myself in heaven a moment, just by saying, you know, just by thought. And I come before God, and I'm a sinner. I know what I am. What does he see if I have clothed myself with Christ? He sees, he sees Christ. Christ he? he sees Christ. Who now, had no sin. Who has no sin. Yeah. So he doesn't see me, which is what I'm trying to accomplish. The dealing <laughs> with sin. So I clothe myself with him. You know, it's the old saying, uh, or the old uh, story, I guess, that you're standing before God, and I know this isn't as accurate <laughs> biblically as I would like for it to be necessarily, but, but I kind of get this picture a little bit. And, and here I am standing before God, and he says, okay, um, and uh, uh, okay, come on in, you know. And I say, well, hang on a minute, what about this sin? And I'm pointing at, you know, my own book. <laughs> and, yeah, I'm pointing my own sin out to him. And, and, he, and he says, well, hang on a minute, let me look at my book. And he opens up the book of life, and he reads it. I don't find that sin. Well, what happened to it? I'm clothed with Christ. It is gone because Christ paid the price. You see? And so I can make all kinds of arguments, but if I'm clothed in Christ, all God sees is the sinlessness of Christ. That's my goal. That's my greatest desire. That's why I need Jesus so much. 
because I could never be perfect enough to stand there on my own. I have to have Jesus. He's the one that brings life. Okay, so let's finish our chart up, and then we'll kind of semi, uh, bring, bring a, a summary to it. Uh, does baptism save? This is a question a lot of people ask. And in 1 Peter chapter 3, 21 through 22. 1 Peter 3, 21 and 22. Now, um, here in Peter, and Peter's one of the apostles as well, right? Yep. He uses an example, and he associates baptism with it. So let's see what he has to say about it in 1 Peter 3, 21 and 22. Who's up? I forgot. I don't know. I'm, I'm Go ahead, up. Marvin, lay it on. <laughs> Randy said I'm up. You're up. Okay. There is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer to a good conscience towards God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone on into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authority and powers have been made subject to him. Okay, now here we have a discussion on baptism. Notice what he said. He says in that translation, it says an anti-type. What's a type and anti-type? If we were just to try to define that little word. So you have the type, the real, and, the real and... and then you have the fake. Mm -hmm. Okay. But you have the real and you have what wasn't real. Now in the discussion, he's talking about Noah. If you go back and read the whole thing, mm -hmm. that he was the anti-type or, or the unreal, the shadow. Okay. And baptism is the reality. Okay. okay. Yeah. okay. Now if you go back and look at the whole passage, which is a wonderful passage, and it's it's kind of worth our while, but we know the story of Noah, right? Yeah. We've actually already gone over it a little bit. How was Noah saved? Well it says here Noah during the building of the ark, which means he obeyed, in which a few, that is eight persons, were saved through water. Through water. Mm -hmm. Was it real water? Oh yeah. <laughs> it was real water. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And so is baptism real water? It better be. It's water. Yeah. Okay. Because it's supposed to be like what Noah did. Right? And Noah was saved and his family through obedience. Right? He had to obey, built the ark, brought in the animals, door was sealed. They were saved by doing what they were supposed to do. What if he hadn't? None of us would be here. <laughs> None, nothing would have been saved. Okay, that's the story of Noah for us. Now we come to us. If we obey Christ in his death and his burial and his resurrections, it says now baptism saves you also. Then it explains it. Yeah. How does it explain it? It says not as a removal of dirt from the body, but an appeal to God for a clear conscience. If baptism yeah. isn't water, what's it talking about when it comes about the dirt of the body? Because that's why we normally take a bath. Mm -hmm. We take a bath, it works the dirt off our body. Mm -hmm. Okay, Not as that. That doesn't mean that. What does it mean? It means a washing away of our sins. A washing away of the sins. Through the resurrection. the resurrection. Look how important the resurrection and the belief in the resurrection is. Now, and that says something else which is very, very important. It talks about our conscience. Mm -hmm. Did you catch that? What is our conscience? Jiminy Cricket on the shoulder? <laughs> yeah, yeah, the old Disney picture? No. It, it says it's a, it's a what of the conscience? It's, it's an appeal for a clear conscience. Uh, an appeal for a clear conscience. Mm -hmm. one, one translation uses the word pledge. Ah. A pledge of a clear conscience. Okay. Uh, so when I'm baptized for the forgiveness of sins, then I am pledging myself to who? To Jesus and God. To Jesus. Mm -hmm. You see, this becomes a contract. It is a pledge of a clear conscience before God. Now, do I have a clear conscience? Not without Jesus. Not without the resurrection. Not without the resurrection. Not without what it means and what it is. Not without death, burial, and resurrection. Not without repenting. Right? But when I receive a clear conscience through obedience to the gospel, then through the resurrection, I find salvation. Now, we'll look at our little picture again real quick. Just kind of kind of bring ourselves all together here before we go on to our next point. We have, of course, learned that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the death of Jesus, the burial of Jesus, and the resurrection of Jesus. Then we came to this idea of baptism, okay, and repentance that uh, Paul talked about in Romans chapter 6, 1 through 11. Mm -hmm. If we notice... 
that we mimic the death by dying to sin, the burial by being immersed in the waters of baptism, and the coming out to newness of life, and he has newness of life by the resurrection. All right? We found in Thessalonians that if we don't obey this, the death, burial, and resurrection, that he's going to seek vengeance upon us. Vengeance against our sin. Sin deserves dis destruction, death, hell. The salvation that comes through Jesus, the clothing ourselves with him, as Galatians said, covers our sins. And we find salvation. Now, if we turn our page back real quick and we look at our little summation, did the apostles teach the exact same thing? Yep. Yes. Looks like it. Yeah. Looks like it. Okay, because what do we have? We have preaching. Yeah. Okay. We have, they believed it. Did they repent? They repented. They repented. Returned. And they were immersed, immersed, immersed in, in water. Immersion. Okay. And they came out saved. Right. Same picture here. We come out saved. Now, so now we have two examples. We have Christ's own statement. Mm -hmm. We have the apostles' teaching. And everywhere that they went to teach it. If we turn our page to page 10, there we are. We're going to look at it from one other aspect. The examples of conversion. Now, we, in our New Testament, we have one book of um, history. It is the book of, you remember? Acts. The book of Acts. Okay. And we're going to spend our time, as you can see in the first part of this study, in the book of Acts. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at example after example after example after example of how people were saved in the first century according to the book of history, the book of Acts. And that's our next study. Okay. Mm -hmm.